God for the blood. Where would we be without it? All right, tonight we continue on discussing the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 5, starting verse number 17. Uh, the plan is to get through verse 26 tonight. We might get farther than that, but knowing me, I don't think we will. So tonight as we, uh, as we start, remember from last week, we're seeing great things happen in the church. I mean, God is really doing incredible things, and this is uh, the last, last discussion we had. We had people that were, you know, just taking, taking their, their loved ones out into the street just hoping that the shadow of Peter and those, the disciples would, would fall on them and minister to them and touch them. And so the power, of the, the power of God is being revealed in his church and in his people and doing incredible things. And we're seeing all kinds of things. Where lots of people getting saved, lots of people being healed, lots of people receiving their miracles and answer to prayers. I mean, you've got people that have nothing that now have become a part of the family of God and where they were struggling to find food or they were struggling to pay their bills, struggling to do anything, uh, struggling to make a living. Now they're part of this family and they have food on the table. They have a place to stay if they need one. They have all kinds of things. And on the other hand, you have people like Barnabas that we were introduced to him as the, the son of encouragement we have him as an example, and of course Ananias and Sapphira as the bad example, of this is what happens when you become a part of the family and you become a part of the body. What God has blessed you with blesses others, and you receive a blessing because of that. And if you're a part of this family and you have nothing, you're still blessed. You're maybe even more blessed because now you have, you have gone into a, a place where you're welcome, you're accepted, you're loved, you're cared for, you're fed, you're clothed, you're watered, but more importantly, you're going to heaven one day because of the relationship with Jesus Christ. And all of that is what's transpired in the early church, in the first days of this church. So tonight we're going to see that the, the, uh, the page turns pretty quick here because, uh, again, we've dealt with back in, in a couple of chapters ago, we dealt with uh, Peter and John being arrested, or well, being being talked to pretty rudely and threatened, well, now these threats are going to be enforced. In this, this particular passage, what we're going to look at tonight, we'll see the threats are beginning to be enforced because these people are about to find themselves not just threatened, not just, you know, we're going to get you. This, they're actually going to do what they said they would do, and they're going to arrest these guys and put them in prison. And um, there is not a prison, there is not a place that you can be put that if God wants you out, that, you, that you'll stay. And uh, I can even, I'll, I'll make sure a story with you tonight about Maury Davis. It's a great, great story of redemption, a story where God has a plan for a person's life and says, I don't care where you've been, I don't care what you've done, I've got, I've got a plan for you. Um, Maury Davis is a tremendous case of that. He pastors in Tennessee. I'll, I should have time to tell more of his story. If I don't tell it tonight, I will tell it at some point because it's, it's, it's worth telling. So let's get started on verse number 17 tonight. Then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. And they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the, speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So they came out and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. What a series of events that transpire here that are just extraordinary. So now all the things that have gone on here leading up to this moment, because you've had, you've had incredible things happen. You've had people being healed, people being saved, all kinds of stuff going on. And the Sadducees, who... I tell you, that name really fits them, and I know that the sad part of that has nothing to do with any kind of emotion, but how sad a life could it be to not really believe anything the Bible says, but you believe in God? They believe in God. There's no question there. They, these people believe in God, and they are so devout and so strict. They're much of the ones, when you see that they were upset with Jesus for you know eating with unwashed hands or healing on the Sabbath or whatever, it's the Sadducees that are stirring most of that up. Because they don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in angels. They don't, I'm not... 
I don't know what they believe in, honestly, because everything we hear about them is what they don't believe in. They believe God is Jehovah, but beyond that, there's, not any, there's nothing that we hold dear. Now, you think about this. A, as a Christian, now, I've never seen an angel. I know people that, that have, that, that say they have at least. Um, but angels are among us. I have no doubt about that. There are angels in this room right now. Now, as far as guardian angels, stuff like that, I, I don't, I, I've never learned enough scripture uh, yet to figure out that there, those actually are, that that's actually a thing, that you have one, I have one, whatever. Um, is it, if I need help, do I have an angel to help me? Absolutely. I believe that hands down, no question, no doubt about it. There are angels among us. There are angels, they're, they're all around us in the, in the, in the spiritual realm, and I have no question. I don't, I don't wonder about that. I don't, I don't worry about that either as far as that goes. But, but they're present. They're there to help. They're, they're helpers. They're messengers. They're all kinds of stuff. I, I, um, one of my favorite stories recorded in, I think it's in um, the, the, one of the, the books that Stanley Horton wrote about the Holy Spirit is, uh, and I may have told this recently. I can't remember. I've told it several times. Probably I'm sure I've told it here. But there's a pastor in Montana, and he's been praying for God to just really touch his church and really do some great things. And this guy's sitting out, he's hunting one day, my kind of guy. He's out hunting one day, and he's sitting on this hillside over here, and he's hunting elk, I believe is what he's after. And, and he's sitting and waiting, and there's, you know, of course, out there, the mountains, they have real mountains. It's not like the Ozarks where I grew up with just extended hills. But the, we call them the Ozark Mountains, but until, once, once we went to Yellowstone, or once we got west of, 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 Color, of, of, of Denver, I found out what mountains were. I thought I grew up in the mountains. No, I grew up in some really hilly, a really hilly place. And, of course, I live in the rolling hills. Again, these are just mounds and humps and whatever. But um, anyway, so this guy's hunting one day, and he looks up, and he sees on the other, the other mountain across from him, he sees a person that is dressed in like a suit, like, like, a, suit, like a suit with, with even a vest and all this. He sees this guy. And within, I mean, literal seconds, the guy is down the hill, back up the hill, and he's standing in front of him. And he says, do you know who I am? He said, well, based on what I just saw, I'm going to guess you're an angel or some kind of messenger. Somebody God sent it to me because nobody on this earth can, act, can do what you just did. He said, that's exactly right. God sent me to tell you a few things. And they had a conversation, just like I would have with any of you, just like we'd have, you know, talking to each other. And God, and, and God used that angel in that manner, to talk to him and tell him, yes, I'm, I'm going I'm to do this in your church, and I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to answer this prayer, and I'm going to do these things. And for whatever reason, God, instead of speaking directly to him through the Holy Spirit or speaking to him some other way, sent an angel to confirm to him. And there are stories all over the place of, of various situations. People have been in accidents, and some, and some mysterious person rescues them out of a burning car or whatever and drags them to safety, and then they're gone. Even eyewitnesses that saw the accident that say, you know, well, I looked up and there you were on the side of the road. How did you get there? Well, didn't you see the guy? No, I didn't see anybody. But they can, they will tell you this. Well, the guy looked like this, and they can describe them. I mean, details and say this is what they look like. So there is evidence, current contemporary evidence of angels active working among us. And I don't, I don't stress over that. I don't worry about that. I'd like to see one. I'd like to actually see one, like full blown wings, whole thing. I want to see like, I want to see the the big bad, you know. 10 foot tall and obviously bulletproof angel that, you know, that I hear people talk about. Um, I've had it said uh, of me that, that, that somebody is actually in this church, it's been a little while, but they said that while I was preaching one time, they, they could see an angel behind me, wings spread and everything, and I'm like, that's cool. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't blow it off to anything other than if they, said, if they said they saw it, I don't have any reason to doubt that or dismiss that. And uh, oh, that's, hey, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad to have the support. I'll take that, and that's wonderful. But Sadducees don't believe in angels. They don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in hell. They don't, you know. So I mean, there there's some modern day people a lot like that. Some Sadducees still living in the world today. Um, hadn't been that long ago. Guy wrote the book about about saying that hell wasn't real, and there's a few other things. Well, there there are uh, too many Christians that don't believe in hell. Um, they don't believe in the devil. They think all that's made up and stuff just to scare people so that they'll want to go to heaven or whatever. And um, that's that's naive and ignorant. What that is. Uh, hell is a real place, and people that reject Jesus Christ, that's where they're going to end up, along with the devil and the rest of his ilk. But, you know, there's the, some of the ideas people come up with that you look and you say, like, well, what about what Jesus said about Gehenna and about where the, you know, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, and the worm dieth not? How do you account for that? And they don't. They'll either not answer you or they'll have some excuse to say, no, that's, he's just speaking in hyperbole and he's just trying to get people's attention. No, it's, it's real. It's genuine. And, and that's, that's something we should be, we shouldn't be afraid of it. 
but we should we should make sure that we do what we can do to avoid it and, and get anybody else we can to help to help anybody to avoid it. So so what you have here in this in this what we just read, the Sadducees are jealous and they don't like the fact that they're getting followers from them. They don't like the fact they're doing things they don't believe in. And see, here's the key thing. You look at mod, uh, modern persecution. Now you can look at this in in the Middle East where you've got uh, ISIS and others that have killed Christians just because they're Christians. Uh, here in the States, we've had that. I mean, the whole thing at Columbine. They looked at the one little girl and said, are you a Christian? She said, yes, and we deny your faith, we'll let you live. She said, I won't deny it. And they shot her right in the, right in the head, uh, right there in that school. And it's just such a sad, horrible thing that somebody would do that. But here's the problem. Here, here's where this comes in. Like the Sadducees, they didn't believe in miracles, healings, angels, all that kind of stuff. So the people that give us the most opposition, that give Christians the most opposition in this world, who are they? People that don't believe. They don't believe in angels. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in this. They, or they believe something else, like, the, like Islam or some other, some other thing that they believe that is in opposition to Christianity. And rather than just say, you know what, I believe what I want to believe, you believe what you want to believe, and we'll see how it comes out in the end, they'll just, they'll kill you. They don't care. They, they think, you know, they're the infidels. There's a movie actually coming out that... Um, Jim Caviezel, who was in, who was Jesus in the Passion of Christ, he's he's in, and he gets arrested and taken into a Muslim country, and it's a whole thing. Um, I think it's based on on the true story, but I, I'd have to look that to be positive because there is a story that closely matches that description of a pastor who was in jail in uh, in a Middle Eastern country that uh, just for being a Christian, you know. So, but nevertheless, what you have here is you have these people who don't believe anything that's going on is really of God, and we've got to do something. And what we'll see next week is you, we, we get to meet Gamaliel, which he's one of the most famous people that we're not sure is going to be in heaven or not because nothing ever shows us that he ever accepted Jesus in Scripture. We hope that he did because he was the voice of reason. And like I said, I'm getting ahead of myself here because that'll be, that'll be next week. But so, so here in this case, you have the Sadducees who arrest the apostles and they lock them in jail with common criminals. And so... What is their crime? Their crime is teaching in the name of Jesus. And how did they end up there? Because these people are in charge and they said that's what we're going to do. It wasn't that they'd broken any Roman law. They'd not even broken anything other than just not listening to the Sadducees when they told them not to speak or teach in this name anymore. And that's, that's their crime. So they're put in a common, common, uh, common prison with common criminals. Now what would that mean? They're in jail with thieves and, and, you know, bad people, people that beat people up, whatever. They're put in with, with people who are real criminals. And real criminals, I'm sure, had no use for Christians because they, you know, they, they would, they, they'd not like, not like Christians as much as anybody else. So um, this has nothing to do with truth. The, the Sadducees aren't worried about the truth being, being compromised. They're just flat out jealous because these people are winning converts. They're winning people. They're ministering to people. Um, you know, how, how would you feel? Think about this. You put yourself in the Sadducees' shoes just for a second. Don't stay there, but put yourself in their shoes just for a minute. And think about how this, how this looks. So here you are, and you're going about your day in your Sadducee way, and you're doing all your stuff, and you don't believe in anything except for Jehovah. I'm not sure how much that means to them. It's more about what we do and what we say than what, you know, actually what it's directed toward. It's, it's your lips are far from me, but, you know, excuse me, your, your lips speak my praise, but your hearts are far from me. That kind of that's that's exactly a good description of the Sadducees. But there you are, and this per this person came to you and said, "Listen, I've been sick for a while. I've been having trouble. I've got this problem. I got you know, I've got a, my arm is messed up. My arm is bad." And they said, "Well, you know, we'll we'll pray for you just because you know we we know God heals sometimes. At least I don't know if they believe. They probably don't believe it, but they'd say it. And so they pray for the guy, whatever, just do their religious duty, and then carry on. And then imagine a couple days later, that same guy comes in and says, "Look." My arm is fine. I met a guy named Peter, and Peter prayed for me, and now I'm going back to work. Well, I don't think Peter could do that for you. Well, no, Peter didn't do it. Jesus did it, and did, you know, Peter used the power of Jesus' name. And you know, So imagine you're in that position that somebody, somebody that you should have taken care of, you should have ministered to, gets their answer and gets their need met somewhere else that should be your responsibility and your job. And that's the problem. So put them in jail. Get rid of them. Get them out of our sight. We don't want anything to do with them. So one of the great cool stories of the book of Acts, this is some of those action sequences that I like to talk about. Um, but honestly, this is probably the most tame action sequence in all of, all of the book of Acts. 
because all that happens is the angel of the Lord comes in, opens the gates, opens the doors, and they just walk out. No action, no nothing going on. There's not a fight. There's nobody to beat up. There's nobody for the angels to strike blind or do anything to. As a matter of fact, the guards that we, we just read there, well, the guards never left their post. They're still on duty. They're still doing what they do. And in the morning, whenever, whenever the Sadducees send for these guys, they go looking for them and like, they're not here. And, well, where are they? They're out there teaching people and out there talking. And can you imagine? You know, we know, right, let's kind of back up a little bit. We know that, that um, for instance, the Roman soldiers who were on duty when Jesus was in the tomb, guarding the tomb, they, they, they went into a deep sleep, I think, if, I remember, if I'm thinking correctly on that. And, you know, they wake up and Jesus isn't there. Of course, then they, they propagate the lie the Sanhedrin does that says, you know, we'll just tell them that, tell them you fell asleep and we'll take care of, we'll take care of what Pilate has to say. Now, I want to stop right there and think about something. I may have mentioned this before, but I'll go ahead and do it again. We think about, you know, well, how could the, the, the Jews really have that much power? If they have the power to get Pilate to not kill Roman soldiers for dereliction of duty, they had some power. Because those soldiers, I mean, that's a death sentence. And they had to be terrified of that very thing by itself, that they fell asleep on duty, guarding something that they were posted to guard, and then when they wake up, the body's gone, the tomb is empty, and they're hearing all these things about, angels and people come and look for Jesus and the, 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 the grave clothes are folded up and all the stuff's I mean, it had to be a big deal. And if the, if the Jews had that kind of power over Pilate in any way, shape, or form to keep him from killing those soldiers for not doing their job, that shows they had, they had a lot of power. They had more power than, than I think we give them credit for sometimes. And you say, well, they, they, they badgered Pilate into killing Jesus they did but that wasn't power that was just I've had enough of this conversation I'll wash my hands of it and I do it just go just get out of here um, and I think Pilate Pilate was in a no-win situation every way you can think of and just about every way that you could be as a leader in that, that in that time period but and that's another discussion we've we've actually had before and we've, I'm sure we'll have it again so the apostles faith in and their obedience to God was incredibly incredibly obvious here because they went and they did what God had told them to do and what God through the Holy Spirit had directed them to do to heal people, minister to people, touch people, do these things in the name of Jesus. They did their job and they did what they, what they, were, they were called to do and, and healing people and ministering to people and people getting saved through their ministry and all those things are going on. And then they get put in prison or put in jail. Uh, prison and jail is two different things in my opinion, but it's different. there's not much difference, but there is some. So... They get put in, and immediately that night, angel comes in, opens the gates, opens the doors, and they, they all just walk out and go on about their business. And their obedience and faithfulness to God is the reason why that God would open those prison doors for them and bring them out. And immediately what happens? Now, this, this is the cool part of the story to me. Immediately you have them going back out, and where are they? They spent, they spent half the night in jail. I mean, this... This is before electric, you know, obviously, any electricity, anything else. So when the when it started getting dark, you went to bed. That was it. So if they didn't get out till midnight, you know, you're talking, they've been in jail for however many hours. I'm sure they didn't sleep much. I wouldn't sleep. And, you know, if, if you're in with a bunch of criminals and they put you in where, where there's a bunch of criminals that, that might just slit your throat as soon as they look at you, what are you, are you going to just lay back and take a nap? I'm probably not. I'm probably in the corner where nobody can get behind me and I'm just like ready to go. You got the right one don't get you, the left one will. I'm also, you know, a little uh, um, 16 tons on them, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, that, that, that kind of thought and that kind of idea comes to me that I'm, I'm, I'm on my guard, I'm ready. You want to fight, I'll fight you. Uh, I don't want to fight. I don't want any part of that. But, but uh, if I have to, I will to save myself or save my friends or whatever. And, of course, we don't know any of that, any of that occurred. All we know is about midnight, the gates open, they go out, and they say, you know, get back in the temple and go teach some more. And what they do, they went back in the temple and taught some more. And the beauty of all this is, is what we see that starts in verse 21. The Sanhedrin gets together for their morning coffee break, and they're all talking and visiting and having a good time and eating some bagels and uh, with uh, lox and cream cheese and having, having a great time there. And they say, okay, go, go get those guys. Bring, bring, those, bring, bring them from the jail and bring them to us. And so they come back and they said, you know what? We went and looked. There's nobody there. They're out. 
I love this. Everyone was perplexed and puzzled. They had decided, they thought they were in charge of the situation, and they find out they're not. And when you put somebody in, in jail, now imagine, imagine John Merchant here in town. They arrest somebody, and they put them, in, put, them in, put them in a cell, and they know they're in there. They know the door's locked. They know everything. Everybody's done their job. And then he gets up in the morning, and the guy's standing out in front of the courthouse and telling people whatever it was that he got in trouble for going in there for. That looks, that is, that is, that doesn't look good on your jail. That doesn't look good on your level of authority and who you are and what you are. And what they thought, and here, here's the thing, I don't care who you are, whether you're a criminal or whether you're not, nobody wants to go to jail, period. Nobody, I've never, I have yet to come across a person who wanted to be in jail. Now you say, what about a repeat offender? I think they're just ignorant. I, I really do. I just think they're just, there's something wrong there that they just, they just hadn't figured it out. And there are stories, they do studies once in a while of people, honestly, of somebody who's been in prison for a long time, you know, 10, 15 years, half their life. In some cases, they went in, they were teenagers, or, you know, 18, 19 years old, and they've been in there, and now they're in their mid-30s, they get released. They don't know what to do with themselves. And there are stories of repeat offenders where you've had people that got out, even got a job, even kind of started getting their life back together and starting to actually have a normal life again, and then something clicked, and they're like, I'm not happy. I was happier on the inside. So they take an unloaded weapon, they go into a convenience store or into a bank or in somewhere, and in an obvious way that, I mean, honestly, there's some, some stories you hear once in a while, it was never even a question. Here's what I want. I want to go back to prison, and here's the best way to do it. And they'll go, you know, rob. They, they're not their intention. They're going to hurt a soul. They're not going to do anything to anybody. They just want to be arrested, tried, convicted, and put right back in there because that's the life they know. They've got a roof, they've got food, they've got even friends. That is the life they know. And that, that is such a sad statement when you'd rather be in prison than you would be out free in the world. But there are people that that's the truth of it, and that's the way it is. So, but in this day, certainly, uh, any time really, but, but most people, I'm going to throw 99 out of 100 people have want no part of jail or want a part of prison. There might be some place to drop an extra block to avoid even seeing one. I mean, I, there's people that way about it. We don't want any part of that, right? But, you know, so, so the logic of the Sanhedrin, or the, the Sadducees in this case, putting them in jail is this is a deterrent. Put them in jail for a night or so, even just one night. Well, obviously, it's just one night because they send for them the next morning. You know, put them in jail. We'll make our point. Life goes on. They stop doing what they're doing to aggravate us, and we'll leave them alone. They can just go on, have, you know, they can have their thing. They just need to stop doing what they're doing. No big deal. And the interesting thing we don't know is, okay, you're sending for them the next morning. What are you going to say to them? Well, what did they say to them back in chapter 3 and chapter 4? Don't teach them this name anymore. If you do, if you do, you're going to get in trouble. If you do, you're going to get it. So not only have they gone to the jail and found out they're not there, but then they get to report. Somebody else comes in and says, oh, we found the guys you're looking for. They're in the temple, and they're teaching about Jesus right now. And so they're ready to go. You know, parents, most of anybody here, parents, are you just deal with children. And we actually had an incident this afternoon, as a matter of fact. But, um, but, you know, you say stop it. And if you're a parent and you've never said stop it, then chances are you just brought the child home to the hospital and that you don't qualify. But, but you have... Even people with the only child, we've got you know, only child parents here, uh, you still have to tell that one, stop it. Now, once you have the other children, there's, it's like stop it, stop it, stop it, or how many, how many you got. And, um, you know, we're dealing with a thing now where we're back and forth on just doing something for reaction and putting my foot on you or putting my hand on you or taking a toy you're playing with and you, but hate it and weeping away the national teeth starts in on that and he's got my toy or whatever or God forbid the little, the, the little one takes something. She don't care about it. If she come up right now and picked up that box of tissues, she'd have it for probably 13 seconds, and she'd drop it and go to something else. But, oh, my word. If they're playing with something and get, get a car, and she goes and picks it up, oh, she's got my toy, and it's just, oh, my word. It, it just, it's like the whole world's coming to an end. And, um, but you, we, have those in, you know, we have those instances, and, and you know, my favorite thing to do as a parent in this situation is, is that, uh, you know, just about an hour ago, you did the exact same thing to him. It doesn't seem you care for that. 
So why don't you stop doing stuff to him, and he'll stop doing stuff to you. And as far as the little one goes, what you know, let her go, do what she wants. Uh, you know, she's she she's 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 the sweetest, most wonderful, precious little girl in the whole wide world. And she does get told no. She likes she likes to get my books and stuff off my table. I got a thing on the table, and she loves to get those. And it's a regular occurrence to tell her to stop that and quit doing that. And um, sometimes I even have to physically take and just I'll move her away. And then she gets distracted enough, she'll go do something else. But, but when, you, when you tell them to, to not do something once, here's the, na- here's, the naive, here's the naive person that I am. I am so silly to think that if I tell a child or a church person as a pastor, one time, that's done. Takes care of it. We're all done. I, shouldn't have, I should never have to go there again. Right. That doesn't work on any level. I don't care if you run a business, if you've got anybody that works with you, for you, whatever. doesn't matter. I, your spouse. Now, I'm not pointing toward Claude there on purpose. That was just what. But your spouse. You would think, because we are intelligent creatures, God has given us a brain, God has given us reason, God has given us the ability to learn, that you could tell a person, especially somebody over the age of, I'll throw five just as a random number, over the age of five who can listen, who can pay attention, who can do what it is, and, and follow direction that if it's a situation, you say stop that once. That ought to cover it from then on. But I know people that are 40, 50, 60 years old that keep doing the same thing over and over and they get in trouble or they have problems, have issues, whatever, and they keep doing the same old stuff. What the proverb writer say? As a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. And we find ourselves in the same foolish nonsense over and over and over and over again. Well, these Sanhedrin folks were like parents, uh, like a lot of parents, and they are, they're taking the situation, and they think that if we, we have the authority, now here's, here's, another, here's more proof of their authority. I mentioned that a while ago, how they kind of got over on Pilate, they got, and they, different situations you see here, but here's how they see themselves. I, want you, I think this is good. Here's how the Sanhedrin see themselves. If we say stop it, they're going to stop it because we are the Sanhedrin. We are the Sadducees, and because we have the authority, we have the power, by the virtue of who we are, we're going to tell you what you're going to do and not do, and you're going to listen. And you know what? Most of the people did. I can assure you that if you were in the Jewish community and something occurred and you were brought before the Sanhedrin, brought before these these people, and they told you, that's the end of that, don't do it anymore. I would just be willing to, be willing to put it out there pretty simply that most people that they told to stop doing something, if they were doing something that, that the Sanhedrin or the Sadducees deemed as sinful or wrong or going against the, you know, going against the, the, the synagogue or the temple, those people stopped it right then and there because they were afraid of those guys. Because they had the authority to put you in jail. They had the authority to have you whipped and beaten, which we're gonna, I'll prove that in just a second, which is what we read, but we're going to say it anyway. Um, that these guys had the power, had the authority, and had the standing in their community legally and religiously, and I say religiously on purpose because it was religion, it wasn't anything that's worth anything, it's just pure ugly religion, doing what we do so God will accept us. That is, that is a perfect definition of what these people had. They had no more of a personal relationship with God than that, all, that piece of wooden altar does right there. They had nothing. They didn't have any, any relationship with God, no connection to God. Nothing that they have was derived from God. Their position, their authority, and their power was man-made, man-given, man-created, period. They had no anointing. They had no unction. They had nothing from God except for the permission of God to do what they were doing. Now, let me, let me qualify that real quick and explain that. We talk about presidents and leaders that are put in authority, put in their place by God. God allows that. And I have come to the place, I'll say this again about the election. I think I said it this morning, maybe in my prayer, I don't remember how I phrased it. Um, but here's the thing I see about this election. I am concerned about it, of course. I'm not, I'm, I'm not delusional about this, at least. But, but here's, here's the thing. Whichever presidential candidate gets elected will not be caused for alarm, concern, flipping out, freaking out, and losing our minds as Christians. Why? The Bible tells us that kings and people in authority are put there at the will of God. If Joe Biden gets elected, so be it. If Donald Trump gets reelected, so be it. It's going to be okay. 
I'm not going to freak out. I'm not going to lose my mind. I'm not going to, oh, woe is me and, you know, the, the, the sky is falling, chicken little, this thing, because I believe God is able to bless his people regardless of anything. Can I prove that? China. China has been a communist country for decades, and they were under under rule and they outlawed the church outlawed christianity had and, and absolutely had the authority and the power to accomplish that and did that there were no churches there was nothing going on and anything that they did find they arrested people put them in prison put them in jail well, during that period of time from the time it started until the time they did finally open up and start allowing churches and allowing some of those things with a lot of restriction there were pastors who were jailed in the early days 50s and 60s that stayed in jail all the way up until recently when they started allowing for Christians to live in their society again. We're an atheist nation. There are no Christians here. That was their, that was their story. That was what they told, uh, told anybody and everybody who would listen. And the reality was that when the bamboo curtain, as we call it, fell, that there were 40 million Christians active living underground in China. And once they, opened the, once they opened it up, they started letting some of these old pastors out of prison who had been, you know, they were young when they were put in, and now they're old men, but they're still preaching Jesus. And there are prison guards and prison pr fellow prisoners and all kinds of people in these, in these prisons who had a relationship and who are going to heaven because that pastor was in prison with them, and he kept on telling them, kept on loving them, kept on doing in prison what he no longer could do on the outside. And that's, that's one example. So... If people can live for Jesus in a communist nation who says atheism is, you know, we don't believe in God at all, Christianity is illegal, you cannot be a Christian in our country, and all those kind of things, and the, but still there's 40 million people living for Jesus whenever, and that's, that's probably a low estimate. I think that, I think that we're going to be okay in a country where we can still meet and have church and do whatever. They're not going to outlaw church. And I hear people, well, this whole thing in California, that's just practice for when they're going to outlaw all of us. I don't, they don't, they can't. They cannot do that. Now, could they try? Sure they could try. But when they do, I don't know about you, but I don't have a problem meeting somebody's barn. I don't have a problem meeting in our basement. I don't have a problem going somewhere privately and quietly. Do you know that there was a time that those Christians, and I'll give you an example, because I've, I've actually heard this directly from some of the people who, who've lived through it, that they would get together to have church. And they couldn't sing out loud, but they wanted to sing. So, what did they do? They mouthed the words. No more than a whisper, not even that hardly. And instead of it being, you know, like we just sang power in the blood, they would, do, they would get in their room. And <laughs> Those watching on the internet, I'm not saying anything. I'm mouthing. Is what I'm saying. They're like, oh, we lost sound, Pastor. And uh, I'll get a message here in a minute if I'm not careful because I've gotten that before. Lori sent me one one day when she wasn't able to be with us. He's like, there's no sound. Well, there really wasn't sound that time. It, we had a problem that day. But, but, uh, and, and with clapping. They get ready to clap, or right, I'll just do the whole thing. They'd get their hands close, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't clap them. But they're still worshiping Jesus. They're clapping hands, as the Bible says, without actually clapping them. They're raising, of course, raising hands. That's, 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 that's quiet, unless you've got bad shoulders and they pop. But, but um, I mean, that's how they worship Jesus. And that, cause why? Because they had to. Because their life was in danger if they sung out, if they did anything, you know, Bibles. I love the story of the Bibles. I'll tell this real quick. Time is time is about gone. Of course, I'm I'm, I'm basically done anyway. But uh, just killing time now. I'm just milking this to get as much time out as I can. But uh, the the uh, the Bible. You know, they weren't allowed to have a print Bible like you have on your lap or like you have. They 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 weren't allowed to have those. So what people did, and this is the coolest thing. Talk about modern day scribes. You know what a scribe was? A scribe in the Bible in Bible days. Well, that was their job was to write, and they took scripture. And, of course, in those days, the scribes, which were part of the, you know, part of the religious elite here, they actually took scrolls, the, the blank scrolls, and their job. Their, they made a living with a pen and with, with however, the, the different ways that they used to, to write things, with the pen and the ink and dipping in, and they wrote for you. They would write Genesis, or, that, you know, they might do one, they might write the whole Bible. You had some that this guy is responsible for Genesis, this guy is responsible for Exodus, and so on. And that was what they did. That was their life. That's how they made a living. Was they, they were literal scribes. Now, as a scribe, the cool thing about this is they weren't just people who wrote it. They were experts on the Word. Why? Because they knew it inside and out. I mean, how, long, how many times would you have to write the book of Genesis before you knew it by heart to the level? One, you didn't have to have a copy anymore to, to scribble, to copy off of. But also, while you're writing that, you've got to think, 
pretty soon you're going to be able to say, somebody's talking about creation, well, I'll tell you on the fourth day what he did. Because you know it, because you've written it so many times. I mean, that's your life. That's what you do. Uh, I think that's kind of cool. But in China, they took legal pads. And I've seen one of these, and, I, and I've, I've, actually, I've actually got to touch one and look at it <clears throat> from my friend Mike Luton. But they would take legal pads, and they would, in Chinese, write in different dialects, too, as far as that goes, because there are so many dialects in China, uh, in Chinese language. But they would write freehand. The Gospels, or well, the entire the entire Bible. There, there are some that, that the entire Bible is available, but it's several. I mean, it's a bunch of it's a bunch of pages, of course. And they would write that. And what you had going on with the church being underground, nobody couldn't one you couldn't get a Bible, a print Bible. And if you got caught with it, you were in big trouble. And they would write on these these legal pads and flip the page and keep going and have have an entire you know Gospel of Matthew or what have you on there. Well, here's what would happen. You would have your Bible and your your pastor and the underground churches preaching out of that, and then they'd find out about the next the next village over. Hey, they started a church. They don't have any Bibles, so either somebody would take and hand hand copy them a copy of theirs, or this is a cool this is such a cool thing. They would say, "Okay, I tell you what we'll do. We'll give them Matthew chapter four, and they just rip that rip those pages off of theirs and give that to them." Do you know that there are pastors in China that for, for decades they preach the same passage of Scripture every single week to their people because that's all they had? That was the only thing they had? You know, I try, to be, I try to break it up and give you variety, and I know I preach series and that you've heard about being better, and I'm not done telling you how to be better yet. Um, but, you know, uh, it's you know, on and on. You know, they, but, but imagine me just preaching to you the same passage of Scripture every Sunday for 10 years. And every Sunday they come, they're so hungry, so so committed to what to being a Christian in that culture, in that in that in that oppression and everything else that they're willing to do that, knowing that any moment they could kick the door in, take them all to prison, or just shoot them on the spot, because that is that's that's where they live, and that's just that's just one place. That's not even talking about other places around the planet that have the same kind of stuff going on. Um, but you know, so so the authority here and the 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 things of the Sanhedrin here, these these people. They had the authority, and notice this here. And let me let me look back here at it, and so, and see that they were even ready and willing to beat these guys and to whip them and to to deal with this, but they couldn't because they were afraid of the people. Because the people believed and knew that something was going on, legitimate and real, and that if they did anything in this way, they would be in danger. They might they were afraid of the people. The people would rise up against them, and the only thing worse then losing some of your people is losing all of your people. Because if you turn violent on these innocent, nonviolent people, you have just turned you've just went from being, you know, an enemy of these guys who are teaching stuff you don't like to being the the kind of people that nobody wants you to be and you don't want to be yourself. And um, so they were afraid of being stoned. They were afraid of, of facing the wrath of the people. So they didn't cross that line and didn't do that. And uh, it's it's interesting when you start looking at some of this kind of stuff that of how of how they dealt with them and they threatened them and they they you know put them in prison. We see it happen again later and all this kind of stuff going on. But at the end of the day, God's will, God's way. And I you know we don't know this side of heaven because we we don't have any record of it outside of the prison guard and his family that are saved in chapter. I'm not going to try to say because I, I don't I don't have it in front of me, but. Um, that you know, the, the save later, and that's another prison. Another prison break happens there, but you have you have these people, and I wonder. I just wonder how many of these people were saved, were did did later come to faith in Jesus because even Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin, Sadducees, Pharisees, whoever, come to faith in Jesus because of what they saw go on, and so we don't have we don't have any record of any of them that I know of outside of that one guard and his family. But it'll be interesting to see um, any of those when we get to heaven that did make their decision and did change after all of that. Thoughts or questions before we finish up tonight? Anybody besides her? I know what she thinks. She thinks she's done, and I am too. She's tired. This is exactly right. So, all right, thank you for being here. Now let's pray, and we will conclude our time. Father, thank you for your love, grace, and mercy, and thank you, Lord, that we know that even though we live in a world that's hostile toward the gospel and hostile toward us sometimes and our brothers and sisters around the world, 
that, Lord, tonight that your faithfulness is, is ours. And, Lord, as we trust you, we live for you, Lord God, that you'll bless and be with us. Strengthen us, God, renew us and empower us, and let your Holy Spirit work through us. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.